OK, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to give this mini course. Um, let's start with very simple introduction. So is the, uh, so sound is OK? OK. So here is optimal transport problem to start with. Optimal transport has become very popular in the past few years, especially. So. I assume most of you have heard about it, but let's pretend not and briefly give again what's it about. So in optimal transport, you give yourself three objects, a measure, another measure, and a cost. So this is a cost. It's a function of two variables. And these are two probability measures. On which space there are these probability measures and what is the cost? It depends on your problem and there are many variants. So some examples of costs. Oh, first, I'll tell what is the problem. So problem. Mm, so it goes back to Monge, 1781, and to Kantorovich, 1946. So you have this mu, which represents some matter that you want to extract. And you have some construction to build. So for instance, this is your construction, OK? And you take the mass from there to put it here. And you arrange it in a certain way, which is fixed in advance. So you take from point x here and you transport it to this place, which is t of x. OK? And the total cost is the integral of c of x, t of x, mu of dx. This is the total amount of energy. If c of x, y is the energy that it costs you to move one unit of mass from point x to y, which is t of x, this is the total cost. And this guy you want to minimize. OK, so this is the optimal transport problem. You want to minimize, and you want the construction to be done in the end. So mathematically speaking, the condition is exactly that the push forward of mu is equal to this shape nu. OK, so this is the unknown, t. This is the constraint of your problem. And this is a function you will minimize, so it's a variational problem. OK? Now, which cost do we use? It depends on the situation. You can be motivated by uh, engineering considerations, as well as more. The contour of this was economical motivations. These problems also arise in geometry, they arise in physics, they arise in many areas of uh, transport problems. And many times, they come with certain preferred costs. So for instance, the simple cost x1 if x is diff not equal to y and 0 if x equals y arises in probability theory, most simply in the probabilistic interpretation of total variation. Total variation is computing the optimal cost up to factor 1 half optimal cost if this is the cost function. On some metric space, cost equals to d of x, y some for some distance arises very often in, uh, in probability theory and statistics. The quadratic cost function, x minus y squared in Rn, arises very often in problems coming from physics, so fluid mechanics, um, diffusion equations, meteorology. OK. Now, 
one cost which arises often in geometric application is some geodesic distance. So geodesic distance on some manifold G is a metric on M um, in Riemannian geometry. Sometimes the cost is not uh, exactly computable, but uh, is given itself by a variational principle, an action principle. So it would be, for instance, infimum integral 0 to 1 over all path gamma going from 0, from x at time 0 to y at time 1. So the cost function would be integral of gamma dot of tau square. If I put only this, uh, I would be back to the dis square distance. This is one way to define the, the distance on geodesy on manifold with this kind of rational problem. But if I, I add, for instance, a potential scalar curvature at point gamma of tau, d tau, then up to, risk up to some constants and time rescalings, this is a cost arising naturally in study of Ricci flow. Okay? And uh, you can also consider more general variational problems. So, for instance, with Lagrangian action, infimum integral 0 to 1 of some Lagrangian gamma uh, of tau, gamma dot of tau, d tau, and uh, this arises in the mother theory, if you wish, Aubry mother theory of dynamical systems, etc. So, depending on problem it comes from, there are there's a variety of uh, cost functions you can be interested in. Okay. Now. In this course, I'll focus on the Riemannian geometry side, uh, particularly I focus on this cost. And because the cost function has a geodesic distance in it, so in this course, C is the distance square on the Riemannian manifold. And because you put the cost, you put the geodesic distance in your cost, then your optimal transport problem, so solution of optimal transport problem, encodes, or keeps, keeps track, encodes the geometry of M. Or I'd say it's strongly influenced by the geometry of M. And in particular, the properties of optimal transport will strongly depend on some curvature conditions. So there are two main ways in which optimal transport is influenced by curvature. So two main links. between optimal transport and curvature. So the first one is Ricci curvature bounds. So here this is Ricci, Ricci curvature bounds are encoded by convexity properties of certain entropy-like functionals defined on the space of probability measures on M. Okay, so convexity properties 
along geodesics defined by the optimal transport structure. Okay, this topic started with Otto and myself now 10 years ago, and since then a lot of people have worked back on this, Cordero et Rosquin, McCann, Schmuckenschläger, Lot Sturm, so in particular, there is this uh, study that we did with uh, John Lott and parallel with Theo Sturm of possibility to define synthetic theory of Ricci curvature bounds. So this, uh, let's, let's call this Lott Sturm and myself. Okay. This is link number one. So properties of optimal transport encode Ricci curvature bounds. The second link is quite different. The second link is about smoothness of optimal transport. Is related to, I write this and explain at length in the sequel, non-local sectional curvature bounds. So this is sectional. So connection number one is certainly more important in the sense that there are much many more people interested by this. But here in this course, I will focus on condition number two. One selfish reason being that I lectured so many times about number one that I need, I need to change. OK. And anyway, as we shall see also in this connection number two, there are some unexpected uh, geometric things popping out. Okay, so let's go on. So this will be, so we'll see here some of the keywords. There will be curvature, sectional curvature type things. There will be some smoothness involved and there will be lot, some non-smooth analysis also involved. Okay, question so far. So this is vague introduction just to put this in perspective with the rest of the theory. Okay, how is, oh yes, some advertisement. So this is my second book on optimal transport, which I recommend, of course, very warmly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, this thing corresponds to chapter 12 in the book. Chapter 12 in the book. Okay. Not all, uh, there are also some research papers which are not included in the book, but all the basics are described in this chapter 12. There are different there are different books. Okay. Are different, uh, first one I think is better to get introduction. Second one is more a reference uh, a reference thing. Which one is better? <laughs> <laughs> of course you have to read both, it's obvious. <laughs> Okay, Stri strictly speaking, in terms of uh, theorems, there is essentially no overlap between the two. Okay. So, 
in these first two hours, this is part one, smoothness and non-smoothness. Part two will be about stability. Let us start by reviewing the situation in Rn. So in Rn, you give uh, yourself the cost C of xy is x minus y squared. This is Euclidean norm. And you take an initial measure, final measure. So mu of dx is f of x dx. Mu of dy is g of y dy, Lebesgue measure, dx or dy. There is a theorem saying that there exists a unique optimal transport Okay, unique uh, up to a zero measure set with respect to mu. And it takes the form of gradient of a convex function. If you are in dimension one, this means your transport is increasing. In more dimension, it means that your transport is monotone in a very strong sense. And then there is an equation. Determinant of Hessian of phi of x is equal to f of x divided by g of grad phi of x. And then you ask, so in a way, there is a unique solution of this equation. And then you ask, is it smooth? So you assume f smooth, g smooth, is phi smooth? And then this is a regularity of mont pair problem. So immediately from the equation, you see that you should be careful about vanishing of g. Or maybe something, some nasty things happen depending on support of G. Okay, so it was identified by Luis Caffarelli that there is an obstruction for regularity, which is the convexity of support of G. Support of G needs be convex. Otherwise, no regularity theory. no regularity. Let's explain why. idea of counterexample. So let's take a non-convex domain. And uh, I take, I want to uh, take G, which is positive everywhere, zero, every, zero outside of omega. I want to construct a situation in which the optimal transport will not be smooth. So let's take point y0 here, y1 here. And let's take point x bar here. Okay. And let's take family fk Converges such that fk dx converges weakly to Dirac mass at x bar. Gk such that gk dy converges weakly to the half sum of Dirac mass at y0, y1. 
And apart from that, FK, GK, very smooth, just converging weakly. So all the mass of G converges here and here, and the mass of F converges here. So in the limit, you get just this, Dirac mass here, Dirac mass here, Dirac mass here. And uh, obviously, the optimal transport consists in sending a half of the mass here and a half of the mass here. Actually, there's only one transport, so it has to be optimal. Now, optimal transport here, Tk is gradient of phi k with phi k convex. Optimal transport here will be, okay, so, yes. This hasn't, doesn't have a density, so you cannot directly apply the theorem. However, you still have that the optimal transport will be included in the subdifferential of convex function phi. And convex functions are very stable, so you can assume phi k converges to phi, say, uniformly, locally uniformly. So here, for each k, you have a function phi k. At the limit, you have a function phi, which is non-smooth, but you know this guy and this guy are both in the subdifferential at this point. Yes, up to, you, up, to, up to subtracting a constant, normalizing constant, which makes no, no use, <laughs> just because uh, convex functions are, are compact in whichever sense you, you want. So, so the support is bounded? Right? Support, yes, I say well, lo locally uniformly. Let's assume like here, yeah. support of G is in this, in this non-region, non and F, yes, so say support of F in some ball, doesn't matter. Okay. Now, subdifferential of a convex function is convex. So all this segment here, all this segment here is included in the subdifferential of phi. So for instance, y one half is in the subdifferential of phi at x bar. Then you have situation where you have con uh, convex function phi k converging to the convex function phi. Then any point in the subdifferential here in the limit has to be the limit of some points in the subdifferential there. So there exists xk going to x bar and uh, yk in subdifferential of phi k such that yk converges to y one half. This is easy consequence of stability of subdifferential. If phi k is smooth, then subdifferential coincides with differential. Then 1k, k is equal to grad phi k, which means of, of x bar, which means some mass is transferred by the optimal transport solution from xk to yk. But yk is somewhere here, xk is somewhere here, and of course you see that's impossible because yk is outside the support. Impossible since yk does not belong to the support of a gk for k large enough. Okay, so this is not the way that Lewis constructs his counterexample, but this is an alternative way to see how you can make things uh, go back bad with, uh, with uh, non-convexity. Okay.
So then Caffarelli shows, and also Urbas shows, this is the only obstruction. If support of G is convex, OK, here I'm cheating a bit about notion of convexity, maybe strictly convex and things like this, then the optimal transport is as smooth as can be hoped. I'm sorry for the uh, Yes. Yes. But where did you use this? Did you, you assume regularity? I mean, it's kind yes. Of where, where did you use the regularity language? Here, to say that the subdifferential is the usual gradient. Okay, okay. Exactly at this point. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Sorry. And what happens, in fact, when you do this is that at some point, for k large enough, there is no regularity. So mass is transported, say, at some extreme points, maybe, of the subdifferential, but not doesn't fill the whole subdifferential. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. So you use uh, some here, but this will use the continuity of optimal transport, if you wish, from B epsilon of xk to B epsilon of yk. So mass will be transported from a small ball here to a small ball there. Okay. As soon as you have, I use, uh, I use continuity, I use again smoothness here. That's a good point. But, uh, well, I mean, yes. So I use smoothness here and here. You're perfectly right. That's all. That's what all the sequel will be about. <laughs> but yeah. can, can you maybe get some smoothness even in this case? That, that, let's say, let's say back just just to R n. Yes. Ah, on R n. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, it it is. It, it, it okay. The, the 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 discussion I will perform for for manifolds can also be done for costs in R n. Costs in R n in general it's not smooth. Say for instance, if you take power p instead of power two. Uh, you can construct counterexamples for any p different from 2. Smoothness is okay only p equals 2. So for some cost functions, there is regularity. Kim, Kim knows, uh, knows, knows quite a bit about this. There are some particular examples in Rn in which you know there is regularity, but these are particular examples. That's right. That's right. The cost is smooth, but as we'll see, it's not a qu only a question about smoothness of the cost. There is some some geometric type condition which arises even for in Rn if the cost is not the Euclidean distance. Power four, you can see already has. I mean, the, there's a problem at the origin that you can see because the the cost function has to move quite a bit. If you assume cost is constant, then anything is, a, is an optimal solution because a, an, any transport is a solution. So no regularity at all. So your transport has to be, has to satisfy some monotonicity that property. In fact, just to get the theory right, uh, the correct condition is what people in, uh, in dynamical systems call a twist condition twist condition is that when you solve the equation grad xc of xy equals z, for given y, there is at most one x. No, for given x, there is at most one y. Yes. This is called twist condition. It's famous in, uh, if you talk to guys like Mather or whatever, they will, they will instantly recognize what, what this is. And this is precisely the condition 
that allows you to get the theory of optimal transport, I mean, good theory in that there is existence uniqueness. Now, for regularity, you need more, but this is the minimum. Now, for the cost, for fourth power, it is okay, but you see the condition will kind of degenerate at the origin, and there, then you, you expect trouble. Okay. That's right, exactly. And, and do you know what the nature of where it lacks its frequency? That's very that's that's excellent question. So that for you know, nobody has clue, and certainly is extremely interesting uh, for many applications. Even for, I remember uh, Michael and saying, for instance, in in, in some problems like in meteorology, you know there are there are. Uh, Singularities appearing in your solution might be might correspond to a front in your weather pattern or whatever. You'd like to have some description of that. Very interesting. So when the thing is smooth, so for instance, the simplest case is where G is positive everywhere in Rn. And for instance, you assume F and G are C infinity, then the transport is C infinity. Now what for other costs? So might be other costs in Rn. Or uh, for instance, the square distance on the Riemannian manifold. So the problem stood wide open for a long time. Um, these papers by Caferli Urbas, this is mid 90s about. And there was, for, for 10 years, there was absolutely zero about, uh, about this uh, more general problem. Okay. Let's list some abstractions. So first, let's, let's go on to Riemannian manifold. Okay. First, is there a representation theorem like this one? That's the first question you ask because this reduces your problem of regularity for a vector valued map to problem for a scalar valued map. And the answer is yes. So there is this theorem by McCann that if you transport mu of dx is f of x times the volume measure and mu of dy is the g of y times the volume measure. Then the optimal transport, so now the cost function is this, optimal transport of x is unique and is given by the exponential of a gradient field. So it means, of course, when I start from x, I look at the value of grad psi of x, so this is a vector, tangent vector. I start a geodesic in this direction. I wait for time t equals 1, and uh, this is where I am. This is where I want to go. And this psi obviously cannot be convex, but still it has some convexity type property. It is C convex. Meaning what? So it's a replacement for convexity, but adapted to the case of square distance. So psi c convex means that there exists some function phi of y, phi from m to r, such that psi of x for any x is the supremum of um, c of x, y, sorry, of phi of y minus c of x, y. Supremum over y. So it's like a Legendre transform. 
except you don't put a scalar product because this has no meaning. Instead, you put square distance. In particular, because it is C convex, it is semi convex. So when you look in any chart, you see that your function has a Hessian which is bounded below, locally. locally. And anyway, this theorem is on a compact manifold. Sorry? Okay. Yes, if it is for non-compact, you have to to change the gradient by an approximate gradient. Let me forget this. Approximate gradient is non-smooth replacement of gradient when things are not differentiable. Uh, so this is for compact manifold, or if sectional curvature is not negative, then the exact same statement is still true. But there are issues about growth at infinity when it's non-compact, and then differentiability is not guaranteed, so this gradient is replaced by approximate gradient. Let's forget this. Let's stay compact. So this is my C convex guy, and this is representation theorem, and there's an equation for psi, and the equation is determinant Hessian psi of x plus Hessian of c x x grad psi of x is equal to f of x divided by g of x grad psi of x. Jacobian determinant of the exponential map at x and I take the determinant at grad psi of x. So this is the equation. So again you have this PDE. So it's a bit like a mont jean equation. It's on the manifold. Determinant of Hessian plus blah 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 equals something and you see that all this is all well, all the second order contribution and all the rest is first order correction in a way. And then you ask about the regularity of the solution here. So if you can prove the smoothness for solutions of this equation, you have smoothness of optimal transport. It's unique. It's unique. Let's put, write it here. So let's see what can go wrong. So this is the equation, the Mojampère type equation on a manifold. Okay, in the Euclidean case, we, you put uh, x cost is square square geodesic square geodesic distance, so it's x square, etc. When you take twice the differential in x, it's a constant, and then you incorporate it inside psi, replacing psi by psi plus x square over two. So regularity for star obstacle number one as in the Euclidean case is the support of G. It's like in the Euclidean case but now in this curved setting it is maybe more, s more tricky. So let's consider this example. My manifold is just a sphere. So I cut it in two hemispheres. Here's my south pole. 
is my north pole. And this is mu, so f if you wish. So it's uniformly distributed on the south hemisphere. And uh, g is uniformly distributed on the north hemisphere. Okay. So what do you think the optimal transport will look like? Transporting this hemisphere to that hemisphere. Emmanuel, you have a guess? Or wh whoever wish, wishes to try? Yeah, break it. Very good. That's that's what that this is what will happen. The solution will open at the south pole. All the equator will be mapped to the north pole, and the south pole will be mapped to the equator. So the solution is like this. So you dig a hole here on the south pole, and you 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 do like this. So the south pole will be mapped to the equator, and the equator will be mapped to north pole. This is uniform distribution ah. here and uniform distribution there. That's it. So T opt maps maps S to so it's discontinuous. This makes no no real sense, but ma maps uh, a neighborhood of the South Pole to something which is approximately the equator and maps the equator to the North Pole. In particular, it's highly discontinuous at South Pole. No, it's not obvious. <laughs> it's not obvious. It has, it, it, has to be, it has to have some orientation preserving property. Reflecting in a way would, uh, would reflect the, would, uh, would, would go in the wrong direction. This is a theorem. That's right. I mean it's exactly. Not it's not obvious. Well, but when you you can you can uh, then you can solve because there's this symmetry it reduces to one dimensional problem you can solve. It is not obvious. Okay, so it's not smooth, but well, hemisphere is perfectly convex, uh, looks perfectly convex thing. It's a half ball, uh, geodesically convex. Uh, so what, what can you do? So the catch is that to that the catch is that support of G here is not smooth, not convex, when you view it viewed from the starting point. So if I stand at S and I look at the, at the North Pole, what I see is this. Okay, this is the Northern Hemisphere. North Pole is entirely uh, open on this, uh, on this large circle. I stand here at S. And the support of G, here is how I see it. I see it in a very non-convex way. So the correct picture I have is I should represent the Earth here on the tangent plane just by representing a point here by the tangent vector corresponding. If you wish, I take an exponential map which is centered at the South Pole. And in this map, in this map, the support of G appears as a highly non-convex region. And there you understand problems might arise. So the condition is support of G should appear convex in all exponential charts Uh, from support of F. So it might be a very demanding condition. I stand at a point here at support of F and I look at support of G as a bunch of tangent vectors. I want this figure to be convex. So 
obstacle number two well some coefficients in the equation may not be smooth and then I would be dead in particular this is the version of the distance but distance in general is not smooth and here there is this determinant of differential of exponential but sometimes the Jacobian determinant of the exponential map might vanish so these two obstacles correspond to cut locus then d square fails to be smooth so what does it mean? you can take this as definition of cut locus so cut locus of x is the set of y such that um, distance square from x is not smooth at y and then you have this singularity here in fact as long as you are on the cut locus these things becomes has an infinity eigenvalue and there is also the problem of focalization focal locus this is when um, determinant of the differential of the exponential map becomes equal to zero so focal locus will be the set of vectors v such that the exponential map starting from x has zero Jacobian determinant at v and then this thing becomes zero notice there could be some crazy cancellation between this and this uh, if you meet at the same time cut locus and tangent locus both both sides of the equation will become infinity at the same time so maybe some some crazy cancellation but still still some problems okay so one wishes to show to prove that you never hit cat locus so this means the distance you go along the geodesic distance is the norm of this vector you want to prove it is strictly before the cut time along the geodesic cut time along the geodesic minus some epsilon which is positive okay so that you always transport uh, um, along minimizing geodesic strictly this looks natural because your transport has to be minimizing so you don't want to go up to cut locus it would be a disaster you would take another path if you if you would pass the cut locus however this kind of estimate is incredibly difficult to establish except in particular cases so very easy it's easy to show that one almost never hits the cast locus in the sense of uh, measure but passing from this almost never to never is really terrible okay now there is obstacle this was this was already two problems and now there's a third problem and this is local geometry and as we'll see this problem is extremely sensitive to curvature and negative curvature in whichever sense negative curvature implies no regularity no regularity theory So this is a theorem a very striking negative result this is due to Le Pair if you take mg a compact Riemannian manifold 
and you assume there is some region of negative curvature, so there exists some x in M, and there exists some plane included in the tangent space, such that the sectional curvature along P is negative. Okay? Just say, assume there is one point and one plane along which there is negative curvature. Then there exists infinity positive densities F and G such that the optimal transport between F times volume and G times volume is discontinuous so it's not continuous from M to M Let me give an idea of the counterexample. Well, not, not an idea of the proof of the theorem, but a much simpler particular case in which we can draw some simple pictures. So negative sectional curvature, you think of hyperbolic space. So let's draw a small part of hyperbolic space, which we think of as embedded in R3, and we think of it as a horse saddle. So this will be my horse saddle viewed from above. Okay, let's draw it larger. Uh, and always when I discuss with my colleague geometers, it was impossible to, to make them understand what I meant by this. So in the end, I found the only way was to draw to draw a complete horse. I will rather do it in this way. So this is your horse, right? <laughs> and that's the tail. And I'm received in the saddle, which is like this, so I'm viewing the horse from above, okay? <laughs> and now, there are some axes of symmetry here. There's the center here of symmetry, O. And I choose some points, A, A prime, here and here, B, B prime. And as before, I will take probability densities, which are very smooth, which respect the symmetry and which will concentrate to some Dirac masses. So Fk volume will concentrate to one half of Dirac A plus Dirac A prime. And Gk times volume will concentrate to one half of Dirac B plus Dirac B prime. Fk, Gk, perfectly smooth, infinity, but they concentrate. And I look at Tk, the optimal transport, and by symmetry and uniqueness, Tk has to preserve the origin. Now, if I wait long enough, k goes to infinity, some mass around here has to go to, for instance, here or here, one of the two. Say, for instance, some mass goes from a neighborhood of A to a neighborhood of B. k large enough. And assume tk continuous. So you will do again by contradiction, you assume that your transport is continuous and you will reach a contradiction. So some mass goes from around A, so A tilde, which is approximately A, 
to be tilde, which is approximately b. But now, this is negative curvature. Here I have a 90 degree angle. Pythagoras theorem does not apply anymore, but it is replaced by, if you wish, Pythagoras inequality, saying that the triangle opens faster than it would be in Euclidean space because this is negative curvature. So AB square, distance AB square, is strictly greater than AO square plus OB square. If you wish, this is Pythagoras inequality. And now, of course, I can put here OO square, which is zero, distance from O to O. And now you see why it's impossible. I am saying my optimal transport stands O to O and essentially A to B. And this is the cost. But the cost is larger than if I had sent A to O and O to B. So contradiction. Because instead of sending mass from here to here, I would better send a little part of this mass here and a little part of the mass here. It would be less cost because of this inequality. So TK had better send some mass from O to A, from uh, A to O, and from O to B. and contradiction. Okay, so this is an idea, idea of the counterexample. And you see here, it's the local geometry which imposes these things, negative curvature. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but uh, it will. The, the the natural guess is that there is failure of continuity at O, and that um, and that. So I'm not sure what what it does actually. Uh, good question. Most most natural guess is that there is something that opens at O and closes at O a bit like there was in the in the sphere. I'm not sure. Uh, Let's give this as exercise for the participants for next time. Homework. OK. So here are some comments. And after comments, it will be time for the break. So first, when you see this, how strong this negative result, then you understand it's a good thing that optimal transport was developed. Yes. So, so I mean, there is no theorem. It's not true that it's going to be a, a monge map. It's going to be a synchronic map, and probably you take both a and a prime to zero, then split the atom. No, 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 no. It will be, it will be, a, it will be a Monge map for k large. It will, it has to be a Monge map. Yeah, but, uh, but the, the theorem is only have density then. It's Monge map. Where it's yes, yes, yes. But here I say it converges. But this is for k large ah, enough. Okay, Contradiction okay. for k large enough. Okay. So first comment. Good thing that optimal transport was developed with non-smooth analysis tools. When you when you read when you read the proofs all uh, dealing with uh, optimal transport and manifolds, it's always with non-smooth analysis. So you never differentiate. You always take uh, differential almost everywhere. Then, as soon as you do curvature, you have to differentiate twice. So again, you use second uh, order almost every pointwise derivative, etc. And it's a big, big mess. And you ask. For Christ's sake, why can't we just regularize everything and work with the smooth solution and then pass to the limit as you do in many domains of PDEs? 
this kind of theorem tells you that you cannot. Even if you regularize everything you want, your manifold, your cost, your density, it will still be non-smooth. So you are, <laughs> it's your destiny if you work in optimal transport to work with non-smooth tools. Okay. Second comment. Uh, nobody knows about the singularities in general. Description of singularities. This was the question asked by Tom. And third comment, even positive curvature and even in 2D is not sufficient. So there are counterexamples. So this counterexample is negative curvature. But there are also counterexamples in positive curvature. Uh, the first one was due to, was, is due to Kim. Then there is uh, one by Le Père and myself. There is Figali, Rifor, and myself. So maybe the simplest is the one we work at with Figali and Rifor. You just take a cylinder a hemisphere here and a hemisphere there. Okay, so like a cigar. And you regularize it slightly into a strictly convex thing, uh, into boundary of strictly convex. And on this, then you have again uh, infinity densities such that the optimal transport is discontinuous. So cylinder. And these are half spheres. Okay, and then you approximate this in such a way that the curvature is positive everywhere. Why is that different from the sample in the field? I mean, the, the, the point of the sample that you do again. Because here, here the, the densities are positive everywhere. For the sphere, I, it was an issue about the support. But here, F and G, you see in this counter example, F and G are positive everywhere. So it's not an issue of support. Because you might say, okay, if it's an issue of support, I will regularize everything. For instance, if you want to approximate your theorem, you say it's okay if I can show smoothness for a dense subset. So for, for many for probabilities which are infinity positive. But even if they are infinity positive, then you don't have regularity. Okay. So what is the good curvature condition? So the good curvature condition is stronger in a way than sectional curvature and was discovered by Ma Trudinger and Wang. I guess Ma is here in the, uh, uh, he, he, yes, that's right. So he's one of the, of, of the discoverers of the, of the correct notion of curvature in this business. And we'll see this after the break, I guess. Other questions on this? If not, let's continue. So even positive curvature is not sufficient. However, to overcome the curvature problem, uh, it will be, it should be enough to impose a stronger curvature condition. And this was found just a few years ago. So, as I said, the, the problem, the problem remained wide open for 10 years. And in 2005, Hin and Ma, Neil Trudinger, and Shi Shu Yawang discovered this thing. Okay, not in exactly in the form that I will write, but then was rewritten by several authors until it has this, this form. So I'll call this the ma MTW, like Ma Trudinger Wang, curvature condition, curvature tensor, and curvature condition. So here it is. So take mg, your Riemannian manifold. This is Gothic S or whatever. Think of it. I, I use something later which is remind, which reminds you that it has to do with sectional curvature. We'll see later why. So these are two points, x and y, 
such that y is not in the cut locus of x. So two points x and y such that distance from x is smooth around y. And I will apply it to two tangent vectors. So this one is in tangent to x, this one is tangent to y. Okay. And here is a formula. Three halves of sum. So this sum, um, sorry, has six indices. All ranging from one to n, which is the dimension of the manifold. And here I put C i j comma r C R S C S K L minus C i j K L where these are partial derivatives of the square distance. So C i j r for instance is the third derivative of C evaluated at x y and I differentiate twice uh, once with respect to x i once with respect to x j once with respect to y r after choosing some local coordinate systems around x and around y so I choose some coordinate systems I differentiate twice in x once in y this is once in x twice in y and when I put the indices up is that I inverse the matrix CRS is CRS inverse okay and now I will have I will contract against Xi i Xi j eta k eta l which are the coordinates of Xi and eta in the coordinate system which I have chosen around x and y so this you can take as a definition. So the comma is to separate the x comma is to separate the x derivative from the y derivatives exactly. And all this so is evaluated at x y. This one, yeah. this is yes. This is the uh, same. So, so this is uh, uh, derivative respect to x s uh, y. You see. Okay. Here is another expression. Minus three half. of second derivative with respect to p eta of second derivative respect to x xi of c of x y where y is equal to x x p and this guy I choose to be minimizer minimizing velocity so this form is more compact but needs some explanation okay so what does it mean this expression this is c of x y depends on x and y so c is always the square distance c of x y is always distance squared over 2 So first I freeze y and I differentiate twice with respect to xi in the direction xi. Xi is tangent vector at x, so I differentiate twice in this direction. This gives me a new function of x and y. Then in the second time I fix x, I change variable from y to p, which corresponds to taking an exponential chart, and I differentiate with respect to p twice in the direction eta 
or rather eta tilde, because eta is tangent vector at y, so I should first transform it in tangent vector at x. And eta tilde is the pullback, if you wish. OK, the in, it's better to say just the inverse of eta by the differential of the exponential map. Now, the Matrudinger one condition in its simplest form is that if psi is orthogonal to eta, then this guy should be non-negative. Now, what does it mean? Psi is a vector here, eta is a vector there. I mean, they are not in the same tangent space. So this exactly means that scalar product of psi with eta tilde, so once again, is dpx x minus 1 of eta, should be equal to 0. So when you have here x, here y, here's the recipe to compute, and you have psi here and eta here to compute the scalar product. You first take the geodesic between x and y, and then you take the inverse of the exponential map, of the derivative of the exponential map of, sorry, uh, this is eta. So here you have this, say, uh, eta tilde. OK. And then you take the scalar product of psi with eta tilde. This is not parallel transport. Be it's the inverse of the exponential map. So because we will always be in non-negative curvature, this guy will always be larger than this guy in, in, in the sense of norm. Positive curvature of the exponential map contracts the distances, so the inverse will dilate distances. OK. It is symmetric, it's not obvious from the formula, but the, the x and y play symmetric roles in this formula. Uh, the first and the second, okay, yes, they, they play symmetric roles. Okay, you can see fr from the first expression here, you see the symmetry. From this, you don't see. Yeah, but like the, uh, ah, the orthogonality condition is symmetric too, yes. Yes. Uh, there is a way to write this orthogonality condition. In fact, this psi eta is the same as sum of c i j psi i eta j equals zero. This is the orthogonality condition expressed in coordinates. Okay. So here are some remarks. Some facts about this thing. So first is not obvious why I should call it a curvature. It's not even obvious I should call it a tensor for the moment. It's just an expression. So first thing is this thing is coordinate invariant. And in fact, invariant under isometries, under local, under isometries. So if I change my coordinate system, the expression will remain, I mean, I will obtain the same object. This object has a meaning, as uh, a geometric meaning. Second, this is the observation of Le Pair. If you compute it at x equals y, so I take two points equal here, psi eta, and I take psi and eta to be orthogonal, in the usual sense, then I get exactly the sectional curvature in the plane generated by psi and eta. 
this is the only reason why I put these three halves, so that it coincides with the usual sectional curvature. So when you take x equals y, this thing is the sectional curvature. So think of this as a non-local version of sectional curvature. Non-local because there are two points, x and y, and two tangent vectors which live in different spaces. Third remark. The Matrudinger one condition has a geometric interpretation. in terms just of distances. OK, we'll see later. Almost. <laughs> Let's say at least it is the b more or less. If the, the uh, things have not been sorted out completely, but the maximal theorem you could hope is that this exactly says that you have regularity. One thing which is for sure, I, I, and I say I, I state the theorem in a, in a few minutes. If you don't have this condition, then you have no regularity. Without this condition, you can always construct counterexamples. OK. I should give names also for this. This, this, is, this is observation is by Le Père and also Kim McCann, who developed the more general theory. And now, here's another observation by Kim McCann. That this guy, x, y, you can interpret as the sectional curvature at the point x, y, which is in m cross m. m cross m uh, equipped with the strange metric, which is the second differential of the cost. What does it mean? This guy is a manifold as a product, 2n manifold. And on the tangent space, you will put a metric which is not the usual product metric, but a metric given by the second derivative, mixed derivative in x, y of the cost function. So this is the metric you put on these tangent spaces. This is not Riemannian geometry, because this guy is not positive definite. It has signature n, n. So it's something else. It seems, so this was observation of Robert Bryant that in fact this, this structure is a parakeler, is called parakeler. Don't, don't ask me more, but if you go up MathSignet and search for references on parakeler literature, you'll find that this construction indeed is a particular case of this parakeler geometry. So it's supposed to be some kind of rigid, rigid world. Okay. And uh, Lastly, let me give some examples. This is a very demanding condition. And it's non-local. Few examples are known, but at least the sphere works. All quotient of the sphere works, so in particular real projective space works. Also complex projective space works. Again, Kim, Kim is, the, is the local expert here. So, Example, let's say the canonical examples you think of, at least they enter, or they satisfy this condition. Okay. And uh, uh, there are some, there are some variants of the Matrudinger one condition. The most simple being that you impose that the thing is strictly positive. E.g., you replace posit non negativity by strict positivity. If, of course, if psi eta are non zero. Okay, and then there is a, we'll uh, come back later, there, is a, there are many reinforcements that, that you can put that would be non local analogs of sectional curvature bounded below. Now, uh, we have, I guess, 
then you have zero. This thing is zero also. That's okay. Actually. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So torus, okay, I, sh I could put tor also T and R N. And uh, these ones are borderline. Yeah. The first three are strictly and the first three are strictly. This is... Uh, it's, not, it's not known if perturbation of SN satisfies it. The problem is lies in, uh, so I'll come back to this problem, lies in cat locus. Because this thing you see is very sensitive to what happens close to cat locus. In fact, the sphere may be the worst of all, in the sense that, that real projective space in this respect is much better than the sphere. So this is, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this. But first, think of it as a kind of rigid condition. Okay. And you realize when I was saying, you, you, everything that I say in this, uh, in the coming, you can think of this as a positive results in the sense that we will establish some regularity results. You can only think of them as negative results in the sense, my God, how may, uh, it is so particular to have regularity. So in a way, the rule is non-smoothness. Regularity is for some exceptions. And we see also, this is funny, that these situations studied by Caffari and Urbas was borderline. Okay. So here are some theorems. There was the tor I think Taurus was adapted by uh, Cordero and Rosquin, uh, but it's the same story as in the as in Aren. In particular, this uh, uh, some people did not believe uh, it because uh, in Taurus there is problem of cat locus, which there is not in uh, in Aren, but it works the same. Okay, so here is a theorem which is basically due to Matt Rudinger Wang. And there is also some uh, version by Le Père. So you take Mg, your Riemannian manifold, you take Fmg probability densities. with respect to the volume measure. So I'm sorry, there is uh, two Gs which are completely different objects. This is the metric, this is the probability density. And you assume, first, that the support of G is convex in any exponential chart Centered at support, centered inside support of F. So this was the, the first condition I explained. You have to have this convexity condition. Second, um, okay, you assume G is, uh, uh, okay, I should say here, and G is bounded below on its support. Second, you assume the transport stays away from cat locus. E.g. support of F cross support of G does not meet the cat locus of the manifold. So no problem with cat locus. This was another obstruction I had, obstacle I had explained. And third, you assume a strict matrudinger wang condition. Then the optimal transport is basically as smooth as can hoped, as can be hoped. At least for C1 and higher regularity. So in particular, if F and G are C infinity, then the transport is C infinity. Okay.
And le pair, the result of le pair is non-smooth result will tell you if, uh, if f and g are bounded, l infinity, then the transport will be Holder continuous. Under the same kind of assumptions, one, two, three. Yes, so it's uh, always in, in, in Caffarelli or Bass regularity theory, you assume that G should be, have a support, and this support is bounding below by a positive number, then immediately goes to zero outside of this. That's that, sorry? Yes, exactly. Okay. C infinity, okay, if I want to write it very precisely, I say this is a smooth domain. Inside this domain, G is C infinity bounded below, and I don't care what's outside. That's right. Under the same assumptions, the pair proves. Uh, Transport is uh, holder continuous without assuming regularity of F and G. C alpha. Okay. Now, in a way, you are very happy that at least there is some positive result. In another way, you're not so happy. About condition one, you're not so happy precisely because of that. You'd like also to have uh, measures that are smooth on the whole domain. <coughs> and you'd like to have, why not, a G that is uh, positive everywhere. This is the most natural question. You can do this, but then you'll have problems about cat locus. So these conditions one and two, you are not too happy about. Condition three, We'll see it's almost optimal. So there's a result by Le Père saying if the Matrudinger one condition is violated, then again there exists F and G, C infinity positive, such that the optimal transport is discontinuous. Um, you, you find a complete proof in my, in my book of this theorem. And then you see uh, this con assumption three is kind of optimal. The only thing is whether we're placing strict by non-strict. It's all on this, this borderline value. Okay. So the problem left by this is attack the cat locus issue in particular to allow for G positive everywhere, G uh, C infinity positive everywhere and get regularity results. Okay. So this forces us to understand some things about cut locus and was studied in series of papers by uh, Le Père, by Figeli, Le Père, Rifford, and myself with about uh, any combination uh, of these four authors in, in, in various papers, I mean. Okay. So, I described some results. Here is one 
theorem we prove. Uh, do I state theorems now or yes? Here are two results. Okay, I'll state first. Yes, two results, three results. First, the Matrudinger Wang condition implies some convexity of M, at least in certain circumstances. So here I'll state these things very loosely, and I will develop later. Second, Matrudinger Wang condition has remarkable stability properties under limit C Matrudinger one condition is sometimes stable under perturbation So today I'll speak only about A, next time I'll speak of B and C. And before going any further, I will make some basic reminders about cat locus. Okay. So, Cat locus goes back to Poincaré, was ligne de partage at the time. What is it? You take your point x in the manifold, and you send a geodesic with initial velocity psi. So this is your geodesic, exponential starting from x, t psi. And you let your geodesic go as time, as time goes. Typically, there will be a time, which is the cut time, depending on x and xi, which is the first time at which the geodesic ceases to be minimizing. Geodesic ceases to be minimizing. Typically, this means that there is another geodesic going to the same point, which does better. And there is a second time, F, for focalization. This is the time, the first time, first T, such that the Jacobian determinant of the differential at TV of the exponential map vanishes. And this means what? That there is an infinitesimally close nearby geodesic arriving at this same point. So both are very basic concepts important in geometry. The first one tells you when your distance, your path starts to be the good minimizer. And if it ceases, then it will never be a minimizer after that. And the second tells you that if I start from x and I want to explore neighborhood here by changing the velocity, it is very difficult. So there is focalization. Even if I change the velocity, I will I will stay close to this point in certain directions. It is a basic fact of Riemannian geometry that focalization can only occur after the cut. Then the cut locus of x is the union of all the images. So this is the set of all x, x, tc of x, xi, 
for all possible xi, xi in T, xi, you can, you can, it's sufficient to, to take the unitary velocities, it's the same as to get the whole. And the tangent cat locus, is the cut locus but looked in exponential coordinates so it's just the set of tc of x xi uh, sorry i should put the xi here xi uh, that's it so this is the cut locus if you wish but seen in your tangent space this is a tangent cut locus of course cut locus is the image of tangent cut locus by the exponential map now I will define tangent focal locus as a set of tf of x xi xi and the injectivity domain i of x is the set of uh, t xi for t strictly less than tc of x xi and the non-focal domain non-focal of x is a set of tick size for c less than focal time so let's draw a picture so this is my manifold, this is x, this is a tangent space, the cut locus is somewhere, it has dimension one less than the manifold. So on this tangent space, zero corresponds to x, there is a certain figure that's the injectivity domain. This is the set on which the exponential map is injective, really one-to-one. -one. So it's as you see your manifold viewed from x. If you wish, you take your scissors, you cut along the cut locus, and the rest you just expand, you just unfold and put it on the tangent space. That's your manifold, unfold and put on the tangent space. This is injectivity domain. So the boundary is the cut locus, is the tangent cut locus. And now, This is the focal domain. And inside here you have the non-focal non -focal domain. Okay? And the tangent focal locus may or may not touch the tangent cat locus, but the non-focal domain certainly contains the injectivity domain. Okay? So basic examples. For the sphere, this is the picture, of course. This is the injectivity domain. It's a ball. This is the figure drawn in the tangent space. And the focal locus is equal to the cut locus. Focalization occurs exactly at cut locus. For real productive space, it's like this. This is injectivity domain. And that's the focal domain. It is away. For the torus, well, the injectivity domain reproduces a torus. So this is the tangent cat locus. And there is no focal locus. Now, on these examples, it is quite nice, but in general, cut locus is impossible to compute. It's a non-local thing. It is very tricky and mysterious. So cut locus is impossible 
to compute while focal locus is much easier. I mean, focal locus, you have an equation to solve in practice. If you wish, you put this on your computer, you solve the equation. Uh, cat locus, you have to test against all geodesics, it's a nightmare. Okay. Actually, cat locus for the ellipsoid, for the ellipsoid, it was solved only a few years ago. Cat locus was determined Um, a few years ago, this was Ito and Kiyohara. If you look, uh, if you look up in the big Riemannian geometry book of Berger, he will tell you that cat locus is an open problem about ellipsoid. That everybody knows how it should be, but nobody has proven it rigorously. This gap was filled only a few years ago. Okay, and in particular for the ellipsoid, the picture is like this. Okay, nobody knows, uh, you, you, uh, nobody knows how it looks like. I drew them convex, but nobody knows if they are really convex. But they touch like this, TFL and TCL. For any point X, apart from exceptional point possibly, there are exactly two directions, two tangent directions, in which your focal locus will touch the cut locus. Did I want to say something more? Yes. So, tangent cut locus, tangent focal locus is smooth in the sense that it is included in a finite union of uh, n minus one hypersurfaces. TCL is not smooth. However, it is still countably n minus one rectifiable. Manifold compact. TCL is countably n minus one rectifiable, so it's included in a countable union. of uh, hypersurfaces. And these are recent results, so I mean uh, a few years ago again, by Lin Irenberg and by Ito Tanaka. This is a uh, Yen Yen Li from, from Rutgers. So cat locus is very mysterious thing. In the non-focal case, non-focal by definition will mean that tangent focal locus and tangent cat locus don't meet. There is a good description Yes. Very good. I f I, 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 it is also true, this is a, fi a final result, but it is also true that the n minus of dimensional Hausdorff measure of the tangent cat locus of x inserted with, uh, in well, yes, it will, it is finite. Which is which is finer, which is say more more than that. This is also in their results. Before that, it was not known. Yes, this this is easy to prove. This is easy to prove. Yes, that's right. I'm not sure. I know, don't know if people formulated that. The fact that the n-dimensional measure is zero, this is easy. This is uh, basically the Radmacher theorem uh, applied to the to the distance function. But uh, these estimates, uh, this is uh, 
I don't remember, maybe 2001, 2003, 2003 maybe, I don't remember. OK. Yeah, these are kind of problems like uh, you, you, when you see them, you think they are solved, they have been solved 100 years ago. But that's not true, they are not solved at all. <laughs> OK. In non-focal case, there is good description of, of, the, of the tangent cat locus. Kind of good description, it basically is like this. So I will draw a picture. Something that looks like this, maybe. So it's included in finite union of smooth hypersurfaces. So this is zero, maybe. And you are C infinity where at these points where there is only two velocities competing. Like to go to some point, you can choose either one way or another, exactly two points, so it's a cat locus, exactly two velocities and no more minimizing velocities, and it's a differentiability point of the tangent cat locus. This is just the boundary. Just the boundaries. So in this with the case, it's something like this. Then you have a good description. This is strange. You know, I mean, the, 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 the focal locus itself is not bad. It is OK, the focal locus. But when focal locus meets cut locus, the cut locus can become very bad, very wild. OK. So when you have only two velocities computing, so see this, so for instance, this point, this velocity here corresponds to a certain point, and this velocity here corresponds to the same point. So these two velocities are minimizing to go to the same point. Then it's OK. You, this is a differentiability point of tangent cat locus. But maybe here, so in this picture, These four velocities would correspond to the same point, four minimizing velocities, so greater than two minimizing velocities, then it's non-differentiable. So starting from this point, I have four different ways to go to this other point. Then there will be a spikes in the tangent cat locus. And these will always be outer spikes, never inner, always outer. And in particular, the injectivity domain is semi-convex. Always outer spikes, and apart from that, it is smooth. So this is a good description. In focal case, nobody knows. If TFL intersected TCL is non-zero. Is it semi-convex? Is injectivity domain semi-convex? This is open problem. Now. What's the role of curvature? So one thing which is very well known, so rule of curvature. Negative curvature is good in the sense that negative curvature implies no focalization. This is one reason why negative curvature is so successful. Positive richer, so this helps. Positive curvature does not help. does not seem to help. In particular, there are results as old as Poincaré 
and uh, with uh, in particular results by Klingenberg saying that for instance so I, I guess this was already known from Poincaré if you take a surface simply connected with positive curvature then there is some x such that TFL intersected TCL of x is non-zero. So there is focalization at cat locus. Yes? No, 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 TCL is not. Uh, think, think of the torus. There is no focalization, but TCL is, is there. No, cut, no, no focal locus. No focal locus. There is cut locus. The compact manifold, you have to have cut locus because your geodesic ceases to be minimizing when you reach the diameter of the manifold. You see? So cut locus is always there. But focalization disappears just when you have negative curvature. Okay. So positive curvature does not seem to help. There is always some, some uh, thing like this, and in particular, is the case for the ellipsoid cut locus is something like this and when you go in this direction you get something which is purely focalizing so one velocity which is minimizing but uh, it's the only minimizing velocity but still there is focalization there yes yes you take hyperbolic space you oh, take you quotient oh, okay. whatever whatever I like it when the audience is, uh, asks, asks questions. And you see, this is one, one thing like, um, in a way, focalization is a local condition. It's all about determinant exponential. But, but cut locus is really non-local. What, what you do here will affect here. A good example to think about is, for instance, you take your sphere and uh, you have focalization here, this was here, but now you draw a shortcut far away from this. So of course in this path, this will not affect the fact that there is focalization along this path. But just because now there is a better path on the other side of the world, you will have some cut locus here. So what you do very far away uh, uh, has an influence on, on the cut locus uh, here. Cut locus is very mysterious. Okay. Okay. Now, now what I, what I, con uh, I, I will state it in conjecture, in form of a conjecture, in the form which so is my conjecture. I will state it in a form which uh, which has good chance to be false, but let's be daring, and at least in certain particular cases it is true. So conjecture, if the Matrodinger one condition is true then injectivity domains are convex. Not semi-convex, convex. Okay. So this in a way is stronger than non-negative curvature or positive curvature. And this kind of result is, uh, is kind of alien in this business. You see here, we don't even know if it's semi-convex in general. Here, the condition would be much, much stronger, convex. OK. So in a way, uh, very positive curvature in this sense would help uh, a lot. So this is kind of a twist. OK. And so here is what we prove with Le pair. So take mg non-focal. So this means that tangent focal locus and tangent cut locus don't meet. Satisfying the strict MTW condition. So remember the, this big thing 
if xi is orthogonal to eta and xi eta are non zero, then this huge guy should be strictly positive. Then, the thing here is true for any x in M, injectivity domain is uniform, is even uniformly convex. Okay. So So in a way this means that M is uh, M is convex in the sense that whenever I stand at some point in M and I look around me so that means I look on an exponential coordinates I look around me I see something convex like on the sphere if I take the sphere from any point I see a ball this is the sphere how I see it in general space so Whenever the curvature condition of Matroninger 1 is satisfied, at least in, the, in this non focal case, I have this same convex picture. So, some comments. First, this is the first step uh, in the proof of another theorem, which we prove also that if Mg is non-focal and satisfies the strict Matrudinger 1 condition and I take f and g c infinity positive on m then the optimal transport is c infinity the optimal transport map is c infinity from m to m okay so in this case, you have about the best thing you would, uh, would hope for. Second, let's compare this to other geometric theorems we know. So remember, Matrudinger Wang is non local notion of sectional curvature. Positive sectional curvature, we all know, implies, this is Bonnet Myers, a uniform bound on the diameter of the manifold. So, sectional curvature positive implies, this is Bonnet Myers, that the manifold is bounded. I can also rephrase this saying that all the injectivity domains are uniformly bounded. It's the same, the same statements. Now, the, the strict Matrudinger Wang will, of course, imply sectional positive. By our result, it implies that I of x are uniformly convex. And, of course, uniformly convex is stronger statement than being uniformly bounded. Uniformly convex the sense that second fundamental form at the boundary is bounded below. So you have this. This is how it compares to the usual bonnet meyer theorem. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes. Oh, it's not clear at all. No, no, no. What about I? This guy? Connection and tangent space. Yes, but it's defined only in terms of, yes, there's no coordinate or whatever. It's just it's just uh, it's just the the exponential map i mean it's as, as it's, uh, it's defined in tangent space but these are tangent vectors we really defined uh, for good they really exist there's no there's no choice of coordinate system or whatever yes 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 it's preserved this is this is uh, yes 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 this 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 thing will be will be invariant this thing will be invariant as as long as you fix your your space x uh, it only depends on the exponential map okay 
it, there is, however, uh, be careful, I of x depends on the whole thing. I mean, you can't, uh, curvature, for instance, is local isometry. I take a small uh, he x here, a small isometry here, small, it will not depend. This guy is global, depends on the whole thing. So in this way, it is invariant under global isometry. Local isometry makes no sense. All these cat locus issues are not invariant under local isometries, whatever this may mean. It's a global question. Okay. Oh, okay, this was the, the one, but I stated briefly. But example would be this one. You take cylinder. You put a hemisphere here, and you take a C two approximation of that. C two approximation of that in such a way that it has positive curvature. So this gives you a surface. It doesn't satisfy Matrudinger Huang. And uh, also, if you, you can do like this, take a paraboloid put a small cone here and regularize a bit. And this thing you can show easily that it will not have uh, injectivity domain convex. Positive sectional curvature does not imply anything about the, the shape of the injectivity domain. Okay. Um, I, will, I will finish with two or three other comments and that will be the end for, for today. I, I expected to give an idea of the proof today, but since I have two, I, I'll give an idea of the proof next time. Um, so here are other comments. Third, this is the first. So first, an example where it uh, applies, applies to M equals real projective space or any, per or any C4 perturbation thereof. In fact, this is the first, first theorem in this business, first theorem of regularity of optimal transport, allowing perturbation of the manifold. Real projective space is okay. Also, what is okay? Okay, let's not erase this. Oops. Also, any um, quotient, any perturbation of quotient of sphere. Okay, uh, okay. I put it rather this way. Any compact manifold <coughs> with strong pinch, strong enough pinching um, and uh, Second derivative of curvature small, and so so. How to say it? Yes, local. I, I would write. I will say locally close to the sphere, and with non-trivial topology. So you're using non-trivial topology in both of these cases, right? Yes, and this is uh, this is comment I should I should make explicitly. So. Topology helps. A simply connected case is the worst. In a way, uh, the sphere is the most frightening because in the sphere, there is focalization at the same time as catlocus and in all directions. Sphere is the most frightening and the, 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 this fact reflects the, really this reflects the fact that in a way, we don't understand the catlocus of the sphere in the sense that any perturbation of <coughs> sphere, so the sphere we understand very badly. The projective space is perfect. But you don't know that the top, that the top locus is the best for the perturbation. Exactly. And uh, I'll, 
I'll, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with, uh, with this one. For so Figaliri for Okay, and also Le Père and myself prove some variants of the theorem allowing for some focalization under various conditions. I will not describe for some focalization. I will not describe here, here. But just mention, and I'll explain how you prove this next time, a corollary by Figaliri 4. So if M is a perturbation in C4 topology of S2, then all injectivity domains are convex. So this theorem is only in S2. For n greater than 2, nobody knows. Uh, we are working currently on this with Figali and Rifor, and uh, after thinking for a long time, we could fi find a counterexample. Now we're not sure. So this is only for S2. This is kind of question that uh, could have been asked again 100 years ago. Uh, nobody has a clue. The proof uses the matrudinger one curvature. And uh, the thing is, no, is the proof is so indirect that, in fact, uh, Rifor, who is one of the people I know who know Cas Locus best, was convinced the result was, was false until he discovered he could prove it. Uh, well, OK. So, so this cat locus is very mysterious. And the sphere, so this is a message maybe of this second hour. The sphere is the worst case. OK, so that's all for today. Thank you. <laughs>